All right, well, welcome to our seminar this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure and also my honor to introduce Dr. Krista Isaacs, uh, who's today's seminar speaker. So Dr. Isaacs is an assistant professor of international sea systems at Michigan State University. So she's been in that position for about 15 months now. And so she is an agroecologist who completed her PhD at Michigan State uh, in the former Crop and Soil Sciences Department. Um, so in between that and returning to Michigan State for her current position, she was working as a postdoc with IFRSAT in Mali. So investigating gender components to participatory plant breeding. And so she has extensive international experience connecting smallholder farmers with preferred quality varieties of different foods. And so if you've had a chance to meet with her over the last couple of days or to visit her website, um, which was in the announcement, and if you uh, would like to get that website um, from me, you can uh, email me later. Uh, you'll see that she, her research really expands on some of what we do in our department, um, plant breeding and agronomy, uh, really help create a two-way flow of knowledge between these disciplines and these small older farmers. So please welcome, sorry, please join me in <laughs> welcoming Dr. Isaacs. Great to meet you, my Aaron, and thank you everyone for the Plant and Soil Science Department for inviting me here, and it's been a pleasure really to meet with so many different people across campus. Um, I didn't realize this is actually a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to start over here, but I'm going to move. Start falling asleep. So, um, so my title of my talk is What to Defeat Overcoming Barriers to Adopt a New Sorghum Variety in Mali. And a lot of this work has um, taken place when I was in Mali for a postdoc and also in the last year while I um, had started up at an international food system at Michigan State. Uh, the majority of my work has focused on participatory plant breeding and um, farmer adoption and seed systems. And so today I'm going to be talking about the intersection of these two things and um, kind of getting at the question is what is necessary for farmers to have access to preferred quality seeds? And what are the attributes that we're looking for in a variety and in a seed in order for farmers to actually want to um, adopt it and have some of these improved qualities that might improve adoption. So um, to start out with, I just want to briefly go through what participatory plant breeding is. And this is a process of working with farmers um, to identify traits and varieties that work well for them. And so it, there's quite a spectrum in terms of participation. There's participatory plant breeding where um, they're actually selecting early generation uh, lines. And then there's also much later in the process, like when a variety is ready for release, it's um, out on the farm and farmers can select the varieties that, um, that work for their conditions. There is, um, in a normal breeding cycle, you have setting breeding objectives, <coughs> and then you're generating or assembling new variability for relevant traits. Uh, there's selection. A little, I keep you a little dizzy here. <laughs> <laughs> selection and you say you do your selection and segregating populations, testing and evaluating experimental varieties, and then also producing and distributing seeds. And so at any angle within these, um, farmers can start being a part of the process. And most of the time, and the context that I'm talking about, like in Africa, where I've worked mostly, it happens at, um, at the, the um, testing and evaluating experimental varieties. But uniquely in this program um, at, in Mali at IFRSAT, which is the International Craft Research Institute for the semi arid Tropics, part of the consortium of the CGIR system, which do agriculture research, uh, they have been working on participatory plant breeding for 15 years or so, or, or, and I've had the opportunity to be a part of that. So I'll talk more about what that has looked like over, over the years. And then when we start to think about seed systems, there, it gets, oh, there's a lot going on in, in seed systems. And what we're most, 
familiar with here in the United States is what we consider the formal seed system, um, for lack of a, a better term. Um, so it starts essentially with your genetic resources, wherever you're getting those from, breeding happening, the varieties get released, there's multiplication, and then the marketing of that, and then there's and then that that cycle kind of continues. So basically, farmers here they they want a variety, they learn about it, and they can get it, and they can get it on time, right? So we also have informal system, which this is also a simplified version of that, and. Farmers are often thinning their own seed, and they um, they may select the seed in the field. They save it for the year, and then they plant it the next year. And there's certainly seed selection happening in that process, um, and they're sharing between neighbors, between friends. There's exchange on the market. There, it, it's a complex system, much more complex than this. But just to give you an idea of, of the two different. Um, Type of systems that I think we're I'm talking about today. And then in reality, these really overlap in a lot of ways, and there's and seed moves between the formal systems and the informal systems. It depends on the crop, it depends on the context of, of the country. And so they'll call it quasi-formal or quasi-informal. So they're just kind of generic terms to give you a conceptualization of that. <coughs> And then, and then there's other models that are a lot messier and like show you all the different ways that seed systems um, overlap. And as you can see here in the formal, we have the commercial breeding and public breeding that we have here in the state. So, and then the basic function of seed systems are quite variable and, or not variable, there's quite a few functions of seed systems, including seed supply, so being able to get your foundation seed, um, having quality seed, seed dissemination, so information flows about getting and having that seed get out there, distribution channels. There's also crop production use, so all of the processing attributes, market demand, adaptation and risk. There's the legal framework, which is variety protection and seed legislation. And there's also variety development, looking at um, genetic resources and breeding and the release of these varieties. And so understanding individual actors' perspective, perspectives and needs in relation to the seed system development um, is one of the things that I work on. And today I'll be talking mostly within the area of variety development and crop production use. And there's a little bit of seed supply in there, but I don't know, I don't feel to get to that whole part of that story. So when we think about what's in a seed, one of the things that we think about in terms of um, seed quality for agriculture is the best genetics. So of course that includes high yield and it includes um, the best qualities for the end use. So whatever those genetics may be. And those are the pretty common ones, and, and then I added in adapted to local conditions, which also goes along with best genetics for that context, and genetically pure, which uh, in some contexts isn't that important to farmers. There's also physiological vigor, physical purity, and seed health. And this summer I was interviewing farmers about seed quality and kind of developing an idea of what seed quality means to them and allowing them to talk about it and talk through it. And all of these factors came out. Um, their emphasis may be more on, on these factors, but it, they also have all of these clear ideas about what is seed quality. Um, it may be in different language or, or things like that. So today, I'm going to be, as I already said, I'm going to be talking about that area, and I'm going to go through a series of data from Mali that's looking at um, how, what contributes to adoption, what's keeping farmers from adopting varieties, and this is a pretty big problem in a lot of countries because there's a lot of variety released, but there isn't necessarily farmers being out picking that variety up and using it. And that may be because 
uh, of a lot of different issues, including adaptation to the environment. Maybe it doesn't have some of the, the genetics that they're interested in terms of culinary attributes. They may not know anything about the seeds. They could be really far away. And there's um, different knowledge systems about understanding what it, what it, a new variety has and what it looks like and what it actually offers. So, and backing up one more step, so why does it even matter? <laughs> and um, estimated worldwide, there are 570 farms, there's 500 million family farms, and then there's 473 million farms that are less than two hectares. So all of these um, growers, 473 million farmers that are growing crops on less than two hectares, um, have limited access to new varieties, not all of them, I don't mean to say that, but have a limited access to new varieties or improved varieties. And if we can improve production there, then there um, we might be improving food security. And what's interesting about this as well is that, so there's, um, let's see, so 12% of, of the land holding are held by small farms. And then about um, family farms operate 75% of the world's agricultural land. So that's the second, the second column. And there's a lot of discussion about that all the small farms in the, in the world are, are what are the main drivers of production and the ones that are feeding the world. But in, in fact, a lot of it, it's, it's still coming from family farms. But then it's implausible that 12% of the land holdings are producing the majority of the food um, for small and developing countries. So we have 473 million small polar farmers, and they use a lot of different seed systems. Um, but the 91% use the informal market that I described earlier. Um, and then so 51% of that is derived from local markets and 55% is of seed is paid with cash. So farmers aren't, like the, the idea is that a lot of farmers are saving seed uh, and they exchange it for free, but it's actually a cash-based market. And it also varies by the, the seed system. So, I mean, sorry, it varies by the crop. So beans are quite different in, ter in terms of um, where farmers access the seed. They may get it from, they, they get 50 to 80% from the local market. Whereas with, with uh, sweet potato, farmers get it from their own stock. It's a vine, it's a lot harder to transport. Um, there's a lot more different challenges with that type of uh, seed. And then small, small cereals, there's a lot more storage happening. So they're getting 40 to 50% from different areas. So basically, and then a maize system is completely different, especially if it's a hybrid maize. Um, there's a lot of commercial development and potential to develop it for, for profit. And so it's a very different landscape when you're we're looking at maize systems in, in this context. So Mali is so this is the sorghum production area, and the rest of the talk today is about sorghum. Uh, it's in West Africa, it's grown extensively. And in Mali, um, the area that we've been working in, in our, this band across here. So as you go from south to north in Mali, the rainfall, and, and West Africa, the rainfall varies um, so it's much higher, the lower here, and as you go north up into the Sahara, obviously you lose a lot of rainfall. In this band right here, this iso height is about a thousand millimeters of rainfall per year. So they have a lot of rainfall in one, uh, in the growing season, which is from uh, June through October, and then a really hot, dry, hot, dry season. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about this plant breeding program in Mali. And traditionally, they have always grown guinea rice sorghum, which is um, a very, it's four meters tall. It has a really tall drooping panicle, as you can see in the picture here. And it's 
uh, has a lot of different uh, mechanical attributes. Plant breeders came in late, maybe in the 80s, and started producing potatum type varieties and trying to get farmers to adopt those. And potatum is more similar to what we have here in the US. It's a softer seed, it's a larger seed, it's the panicle is closed, the air doesn't blow through it, um, and it's much, uh, it produces much more flour and it's a different, it's different. So there's been a lot of challenges in terms of adoption of this variety at this type of uh, garden in Mali. And so the plant breeders at Ikrasat came, started trying to understand what was going on here and started to look at issues of gender and looking at the germ, local germplasm as a base, a genetic base for improving sorghum varieties in Mali. So some of the questions that we've been asking are, so plant breeding is for who and for what? And who is involved and who is driving the agenda? So maybe here in the States, it's not as important to understand all the nuances of what the consumer needs in a variety, but in this situation, these are producers and consumers of, of what they're growing. And so they have a lot more criteria or thoughts going into like, what do I want my sorghum to look like? Or what do I, what am I used to looking like? And some of the things that I've encountered and uh, the team that I've worked with have encountered as we're talking more about gender and plant breeding is this idea of like, so plant breeders have said varieties are gender neutral or the benefits from new varieties are for everyone. Farm households function as a unit and work benefits are shared and we cannot breed varieties only for women. And all of this comes out of like a, lot, a big push within this in international sphere for there to be more gender sensitive research. And breeders are like, I can't possibly breed for all these different contexts and for the issues that women have too. And so I wanna go through some of the information that we found out um, in Mali to kind of think about some of these issues that breeders have brought up. So one of the factors that influences how farmers, farmer adoption of new varieties is whether it's adapted to the local environment. And the breeder, plant breeders in Adekrasat developed guinea ray sorghum hybrids from the local germ plasm. So they did crosses with the guinea and the cadium that I showed you a moment ago. And they done the participatory plant breeding on farm with the farmers to uh, test these different varieties. And one of the studies that we did was looking at um, about 1,500 on-farm studies, on-farm trials. So farmers grew three different varieties. They grew um, a hybrid variety, an improved variety, and a local variety. And then they, they grew it under farmer practice, which is no fertilizer, and under an improved practice, which included fertilizer. And the reason why farmers don't use fertilizer on sorghum is because they use a residual fertilizer leftover from the cotton rotation in the prior year. There are some cases where they use fertilizer, but it's, it's expensive, and so they often don't. So we looked in three different zones, Duela, Coachella, and Mande up at the top. And we worked on both women and men planted these varieties in their own fields. And they were managed under their conditions in terms of weeding and, and things like that. So it, we were looking at the variety type versus the management type. And our results indicate that management practice and the variety type were, were the major factors in the system. We looked at two different years. Um, and what you can see is that, so the pink bars are the farmer practice and without fertilizer. And there's not a lot of variation in the local versus the improved versus the hybrid variety. Although I, I believe that local and hybrid is slightly different, but not much. And then, on the improved practice, once you added the fertilizer, you saw quite a huge jump in the yields of the sorghum varieties, and the hybrid varieties um, responded the most to that, which isn't terribly surprising. 
as we know, a lot of hybrids are more responsible and better conditioned. So the productivity of these different sorghum types vary quite a bit by region too. So in Coachella, the pink bar, the hybrid varieties did exceptionally better than, uh, than in the other locations. And the improved, and then the local variety also did fairly well in Coachella. And this can be explained mostly by some of the, the farming conditions that are in those different places. In Coachella, they grow a lot more cotton. They're much more de developed in, in terms of their um, production system. And in Mande, they, uh, they live closer to Bonaco, so there's a little bit less emphasis on agriculture <coughs> and not as much uh, resources in terms of fertilizer and rotations and land. When we look at what happens um, in the hybrid versus the local variety, we can see that about, we wanted to ask the question, who's benefiting from, from these hybrid, hybrid um, varieties? And you can see right here that only at about 35, 37% of farmers and above actually gain anything from using an improved practice and a hybrid, or from using a hybrid versus a local. So there's 35% of farmers that are not gaining from using hybrids in, in any condition, whether it's fertilized or not. And then as it increases, you can see that improved practice increase the, the gains that you have. And then you break, we broke this down by gender, and looked at um, who's benefiting and when. And the same, so, you, so this aqua and red, so the two bars at the top, are under farmer practice without fertilizer. And so there's not a lot of difference between men and women. But then when you look at improved practice of the, high, the, the performance of the hybrid compared to the local, you can see that men in the purple, this outside bar, are benefiting sooner and more from being able to grow a hybrid variety. One of the reasons for this may be, um, and this is from a separate study, but women are allotted their fields at the end, after all the other fields in the household have been allotted. So the family grows their sorghum fields or in their cotton fields, whatever it is. And then the women are allotted a smaller plot for their, their other crops. And the phosphorus availability is even lower in women fields. So this is looking at break E um, in both men and women's plots. And a deficiency threshold for uh, parts per million of, of um, phosphorus is about 11. And as you can see here, the fields are mostly lower than that. And then in the last column on the left, uh, women's fields are, are quite low. So this might be one of the explanations why women are even seeing less than um, men in terms of response from the varieties or types of varieties. So some of the conclusions from this adaptation study was management practices obviously increased yield on farms no matter the variety type, but the hybrid um, benefits are for about 65% of farmers and the other 35% are not necessarily gaining from that. And this is consistent across years and locations. Um, hybrid yield was improved with management, men benefited more from the hybrids, and unfortunate women don't benefit from improved practice with hybrids. Krista, yes. other than fertilizer, what were the kinds of management practices that were improved production practices? That's it. So it should, it should be fertilizer. called fertilizer. <laughs> um, in Mali, are there women crops and traditionally men crops? Yes. So could it be a matter of the, it, and, and so what does sorghum, is that a man crop or a woman crop? It's a men's crop and it, uh, so women will grow it, it's a good question. Men, women will grow it on, in their fields as well though. So these are, 
and they the women take care of the family men crop as closely as they do as the men do. So they're completely involved in all activities in the family field, but it's considered a men's crop. And the men are so the men manage it. Too. Yeah. Men manage it. And then women, the women that were involved in this study were um, also were growing for them. Any other questions? So where was where are we here? Okay. So moving on to some of these other attributes of best genetics for um, end use. And the other one, this next one I want to talk about is adaptation, um, culinary attributes. <clears throat> so a pretty interesting way that this sort of team has developed, uh, has brought women into the process of this men's crop, men's crop is through the culinary test. And this is a pretty cool thing to see. Um, I got to participate in it the whole time I was there and working with the women on this and analyzing the data. And it's like a food lab being propped down, plopped down in the middle of a village. And they everything is measured. And, and here's an example of four, you know, these are the four different varieties of sorghum that they're going to be testing. So the culinary test happens one time per year. It happens in those three zones that we saw in the other study. Uh, and the evaluation data from the participatory plant breeding that happens in the field is given back to farmers in all of these communities, and they discuss which varieties they want to test for the culinary uh, test. And then the four varieties are tested in the culinary test, and there's a, a check as well, a local check. And then it's prepared into the most common form of food that they use with sorghum, which is tow. So they test, so they pound the grain, and this is time. And then they sort out the bran and the grit and the flour, and this is all weighed. Uh, they measure the water that's put into it. And then all the women cook the, the sorghum at the same time into the tow. And then uh, this is the, the resulting product, which is so, and it's uh, a very thick paste, kind of like polenta, and it's used to scoop up sauce. Um, and it's ubiquitous throughout Mali. And you can see from this that there's a lot of different colors. Uh, there's also different textures. And all of these things are rated by 25 community members, including the women that processed it and then men as well. And they're blind, they're tested blindly. And so they, they rate them based on their culinary in terms of taste, color, and consistency, and conservation the next day. So how well it will conserve the next day. Uh, and then, they, so we, I kind of mentioned this, but these are some of the assessments we do of flour to grit ratio, the soaking time, the cooking time, the taste, and then the grain quality. And results from this have given us a really good idea of some of the important processing traits that really influence how farmers are, whether or not they're willing to try a new variety. So this is looking at the percent weight of bran removed during the decortication process on 32 different varieties. And so this billy variety only had 10% of bran of brand removed from the product, whereas Peke was uh, over 30%. And if you think about the so bran is not something that farmers are using to eat, or they're not eating it. So your variety, you lost 30% of your yield just in bran, and it's not a very um, appealing variety in terms of food yield. And another example here is a ratio of bran to flour to grit, and the interest in whether there's more flour or grit in the variety depends on the region and their the local foods that they eat. So a lot of people eat toe, and that's the flour, but also a lot of people eat um, other dishes that are based on the grit. And so a variety, so here in, in Monday, they, they prefer to, they want to have a higher ratio of grit 
And so something like Segutana is actually the local variety and it has that ratio of higher flower and higher, higher grit. And then in Cristela, they actually eat a lot more poe, so more flower is appealing. And so they might go for one of these varieties like Poppy, which has quite a bit of flower and a low amount of land. So again, it's just looking at this idea of, of food yield. And then the global sensory appreciation of the varieties across the villages also gives us an idea of how these, all these different environments are quite challenging in terms of trying to identify varieties that are going to work for them. As you can see on the bottom here, we have the villages, and then uh, the, the colored bars are five different varieties. And these are as appreciation scores, the global sensory appreciation score for, uh, for each variety. And so Welly, this green bar on the bottom, is generally unappreciated in all of the villages. And so there's trends here, but there are also quite a bit of differences. And then there's also the evaluation of the grain. So in terms of grain size, in terms of smut, this all happens before the actual cooking, in terms of the gloom, which impacts the stretching. And that also varies um, between the varieties. And this and Wiley again has a very low score from the farmers that evaluated this grain. So all of this information. Is collected. We have a feedback session at the end. The results are presented to the farmers and then they talk to us again. Um, and the results are used to inform the choices for the next trial. So, some of the important conclusions that have come out of this, um, and this, this method was validated in, uh, there's, in 2007 and 2008. They did, we, they did. Uh, trials and culinary tests in all the different regions but with the same variety and check to see um, what they validated it and then they were able to see whether or not it made sense to continue doing these culinary tests in all the different areas and because of all these differences it, it, it does tend to make sense um, for the situation. So food yield is, is really important and a lot of the times breeders are often go and talk or extension people, whoever it is, go and talk to the men who are the agronomic managers of the crop and this whole idea of what the crop actually yields in terms of food as an end product um, has come out of this and it's interesting, something interesting we learned from involving women. <clears throat> so again, variety preferences vary across the zone. Regional dish preferences influence uh, their variety preferences. Taste, color, and consistency are important factors, um, but they but there are other elements. And then involvement of the whole community and evaluation has has been able to increase women's voice in what is a um, predominantly male crop. <coughs> So the next two topics I want to touch on are exposure to new varieties and information and knowledge systems. And I'm going to do this through uh, two studies that I conducted. One was a three-year study that didn't, I did finish the data collection on the third year. And this was looking at farmer adoption of, of hybrid varieties. And so those hybrid varieties that I talked about a little bit earlier have been, uh, are being produced by seed cooperatives in all of these different locations. And those seed cooperatives are trying to sell the seed to farmers. And so I was trying to understand who was buying the seed and how they were, um, and what was it that they liked about those, those varieties and who was it that, um, what type of people were actually buying the, the, the hybrids. And so that, I have some preliminary analysis on that. And then the second study was with a PhD student from Mali, and we worked together on a lot of this stuff. And he was developing, he, he's a plant breeder, a Georgian plant breeder, and he has wanted to be able to learn how to do qualitative methods. 
And so we did and I've done it. I, we I used panel forms and a panel sorting process to understand farmers' preferences in terms of panicles, shape, and form, and grain quality. So there were 63 interviews in the second year buyers of hybrid sorghum. Um, and that's just up until the second year. And I did a thematic analysis of that. And then the panicle sorting activity and focus group that Jack and Diallo did, um, we've just published in crop improvement. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. So interview results. So the traits that are preferred, um, even for the hybrids, it doesn't, it doesn't really vary that much um, from improved, is that they yield an improved fire quality. So that actually that is one advantage of these hybrids is that some of them have been developed to have better fire quality in the stem. Um, and that was one of the reasons they were adopting them. Environmental adaptation, they are really concerned about whether or not these varieties are going to work in the field. Timely maturity, and this is really an issue related to um, changes in the rainfall throughout the season. They, sorghum is photos, um, photo period sensitive, and it, and there's variations in that, and they prefer it to actually, they want to maintain that trait, even though there's a lot of breeding that has tried to push that out. <coughs> Excuse me, because sorghum gets planted later in the season. And so if they can push all the, they're planting all the other crops first and then they plant sorghum. And so if they can, if the rainfall start late and then the sorghum gets pushed back, they can still plant it and get a harvest because it um, will um, fully reach maturity in time for the end of the season, no matter when you plant it, if it has a higher photo period sensitivity. So the chemical form is of interest too, and the grain weight, and grain hardness, and storability, and I'll talk about those more in a moment. This picture at the top is a picture of one of the hybrid varieties. Uh, I think it's Pablo, and then this is a local variety. And so this is actually a variety that the farmers really love, despite, I mean, it is different in terms of its height and its shape, but it, it yields well and has a high forage quality. So from these interview results with the farmers, uh, one of the interesting things we found was that it takes an average of four years of exposure before the farmers are even willing to purchase a new seed and sometimes even try new seeds. And this is even when they're friends with a seed cooperative member or they see in the field in a demonstration trial for multiple years, it takes four years before they're even really willing to, to test it themselves. Knowing the seeds were produced locally by someone they knew encouraged them to purchase it. Uh, they really didn't want to buy a seed from elsewhere. And traditionally, they have always exchanged seed locally or with a neighbor. I mean, if they visit another town, went to a wedding or something like that, and they saw it growing, that's how they normally get the seed. Even after the farmers finally purchased it, they tested it for two to five years. They wanted to make sure that uh, it did well in the different seasons and in their growing conditions. And then uh, farmers also manage different, a diverse range of varieties. So even if they grew, if they bought a new variety, they would maintain their traditional variety and they may even be growing a few other ones um, for different purposes. An interesting family hierarchies uh, influence the decisions that um, do actually even test a new variety. So there is a, a few instances where uh, the men were, so the head of the household didn't want to try the new variety, and the manager of the field, so his son, who's probably 50 years old, didn't have the jurisdiction to say, ah, I really want to try this variety. And it wasn't until the varieties were offered for free that he went and tested it um, in a place that his dad wouldn't see. And at that point, he <laughs> They um, brought their dad out like, look at this new variety, it works really well. <laughs> so there's a lot of challenges in terms of that and, and getting um, farmers to try new varieties. So we also did, uh, this is the work of Shaka. He did a panel, we did a panel sorting activity, looking at all these different types of uh, 
I don't want to show you this one first. There were five different groups of, of cannibals, of Bergen cannibals that had different shapes, different ar plant architecture, and they're based on the guinea versus caudatum, and then we also had Jura race in there. <clears throat> and these all have different cannibal shapes, like they're compact forms or they're loose, and farmers have a lot of opinions about that. So this is the sample size. We talked to about 175 different um, people, whether that was in individual interviews or focus groups. And from that, we a lot of um, we did a thematic analysis of all of the, the traits that emerged through these conversations, and we were specifically asking about cannibal size and grain quality. And Obviously, yield is always number one. There's no doubt about that. And um, but if yield is really high, it doesn't, and these other attributes are not there, then it, it doesn't really matter. And so some of these other attributes include um, hardness, so that improves the grain storage. And then um, I don't really want to touch on a few of these. The grain food quality, like I talked about before, and then uh, hardness and profit. So a harder grain um, had was when it, they said it gave them more profit, and then there's also more volume in terms of like if, if you look at the volume to weight measurements, then uh, there is a profit there in certain types of grain. So. From that data, which I didn't get to go too in depth on, but it gives us some information about grain yield. Again, it's not just grain yield, but how much is useful as food via the whole post harvest process. So, that information about um, what they're looking for in terms of um, food quality and, and um, uh, great hardness and grain pounding also came out in these interviews. Varieties must combine necessary adaptation and processing traits. And interesting, farmers associate specific cannibal types and plant types with a suite of traits. So when they're thinking, I really want a variety of, I mean, a guinea race variety, they associate that really tall plant and that and the drooping cannibal with hard grain which um, it works really well in terms of pests and disease control because the wind blows through it. They have all these attributes that they associate with that, that structure. And then when you bring in a caudatum variety, they're like, is it possible to have a caudatum variety that has hard grain and gives you these attributes? So this is an important piece to me in that um, farmers have these traits that are important to them and they because they've been farming with guinea race for generations, they conceptualize that guinea race having those attributes. But a breeder can come along and be like, oh, I can create a caudatum that shorter height and has a large higher yield and still has some of those attributes. So I think it's really important to think about how people conceptualize things and how their knowledge systems come together to how we can bring those, understand both those systems to create something that works. Um, and interestingly, men and women contribute unique and complementary knowledge. So we have the women that are giving these processing right attributes, and then the farmers, the uh, men are talking about the agronomic <coughs> attributes, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. That plant breeder doesn't have to develop a variety to meet the woman's needs and the, the men's needs. They actually are complementary, and they're deciding together on what, these crop, what this crop looks like and what variety they need. Most of the time. So, in conclusion, I just want to kind of think about like how do we breed for so many different contexts and to improve uh, and improve access to seed. And I think, and hopefully, this data has shown you a little bit about how complex it is, even within the same country and in these different environments. There are different needs in terms of adaptation and in terms of end use. And what I think one of the ideas that might help with that situation um, is participatory plant breeding or some type of deregulation of how varieties are released. So
so that there's more varieties that are getting into the hands of farmers so that they can be catching them. We, it's resource intensive perhaps to have um, plant breeders developing a lot of varieties like that for all these different niches. It's really nearly impossible. But if you can develop within a range of attributes that farmers would need for a region, then perhaps enabling them to test those varieties is one way to do that. And then these co seed cooperatives um, in Mali anyway are producing that seed. So they have access to the foundation seeds and then they, um, they produce hybrid seeds and sell it locally, which also gets at some of these issues of trust and, and setting good stuff up. <laughs> So some of the challenges here of and, and thinking about this are institutional support. A lot of institutions within these countries in Mali would, would love to be able to do this on a regular basis, but all of this, these activities require funding and they have external funding from donors. And the national agriculture research programs and public entities don't necessarily have the resources to do this type of work. Uh, and farmers and policies don't necessarily support that either. So varieties have to be registered. They have to be completely unique. There's, there's a lot of different um, policy angles to that as well. And farmers are, are risk adverse and take time to adopt new varieties. And that's not a new concept. Here, I was just talking yesterday about um, the diffusion of hybrid maize or corn here in the US. And it took a while before people were willing to grow it and test it. And there's, there's an initial flush of adopters and then there's, it goes through a cycle where people, um, some other people start to grow it. And then at the end, finally, everyone's growing it. And I'm not saying, yeah. So it, it takes time for new technology to be adopted. And there's a lot of challenges in terms of information flow and how people even learn about those new rights. So back in July on the cover of the CSA News, there the title is Educating the Next Generation of Plant Breeders. And they were talking about um, how there's only the availability, these are the, I think this was the prognosis of the availability of plant breeding positions in the US. And they were talking about how you may need to emphasize different skills, um, especially because all of that is in, a lot of it is in the private sector. And they were emphasizing management and business um, factors as well. And one of the questions I'd like to pose to you as we open up the discussion is, shaping plant breeders for the future, what does it look like? Like given all of this information, and that I've just shared with you, are there other things that we might think about how, what our plant breeders, at least in an international context, may need to learn, or what plant breeders in this country need in terms of organic systems or for vegetable systems, like how might that look different? So uh, I just wanted to add my contributor, there's a lot of contributors, all the farmer organizations uh, in the different regions in Mali, Agricultural Extension Service, researchers that I've been collaborating with, um, and some of our funding sources. So the different villages prefer different varieties of sorts. Part of my question is, is if you plant those different varieties in different villages, you could have different outcomes on those varieties given a dry period or seeds or something like that. So, how is were you able to adjust for that at all in, in these, or is it, I mean, how do you know that it wasn't just one variety had poor performance and therefore it, it wasn't favored? Uh, uh, so, in the in the trials, it does help. They do do it for two years, so okay. th that helps a lot. Um, the, and the trials I showed you were two years. But the participatory plant breeding that happens that when some varieties go out is done for two years. And so, um, yeah, farmers can see it that way, but otherwise, and whatever they, all of these that go through the processing part have been tested.
so for their uses, the, the tight head versus the loose head, is there is there a difference for them why they wouldn't want the tight head? Yes. So well, the first one being what I said at the end there is that they associate the tight head with soft grains, like usually for storage, food, and stuff like that. It's easier, and it has a lot more flour than the one. But and then that tight head also they say attracts um, disease issues because there's a lot of rainfall during the season, and so I think even during um, when they're trying to dry the crops and might cause issues. They um, so they say they like the air to blow through it. The droopy chemical they actually like because the birds. <laughs> well, one if it's really tall, the animals can't get to it, and then the droopy chemical the birds will light on it and then it bounces. So they can't eat it, whereas that tight chemical on the bird can sit on there and peck away at the grain. So those are some of the issues. Mm -hmm. I think there's just this um, in terms of the price that on per acre that it's just a lot more market oriented than, than we typically imagine. And so if are there large differences in, in price that we can just observe in the market, okay? And and, and 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 in terms of like just getting your, I don't know, in terms of trying to figure out how much cash that a household has to pay for food, because you brought up the article of the season, how big is that as a percentage of, you know, like what they take to dinner mm -hmm. to do for the year? It's a great question, and I, particularly the last one, I don't know the answer to it. I have heard that they, so by the time that agricultural season comes along, that's when they're the most cash poor, obviously. And so they're going to invest in the other, they invest in the cotton um, <coughs> seed and the cotton uh, leaf input before they invest in the other crops. And so, uh, but I, I actually, I don't know how, how much it would cost to do that. And then the sorghum seed that the seed cooperatives are selling, yeah, it's it's much more expensive. It's it's four times or more expensive than buying grain in the market as a seed, and it's in the hybrid even more. So if you're buy, you can buy the seed cooperatives actually produce local varieties as well. So they can they sell those and they sell the improved varieties and they sell the hybrid and hybrid they have. Maybe they're like 700 guinea francs, and then on the market it would be 200 guinea francs for grain, and then the other ones are meat. The, the nice thing about sorghum is that it's a small grain, so it only they only need six kg for a hectare versus like peanuts. You might <laughs> need 20. Or Does your um, do the, the food 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 traits or the you know, appreciation traits are those just changed very much with nitrogen with fertilizer or is it most are they mostly just driven by the by hybrid or the variety type and not so much driven by the management side of things? That's a great question. I don't I don't know. We haven't done a comparison of how the food yield is under different um, fertilizer treatments and then. In terms of the varieties, it, I don't, I haven't seen a trend that hybrids have, you know, more burn or something like mm -hmm. that. It's just based on the, the variety. Yeah. Given the difference between the hybrid seed and the grain, given all the attributes and yield, is it worth it for them to buy the hybrid? I think it depends. <laughs> As there's clearly situations where the hybrid is, is great, and they're seeing very high returns on that. And if they can afford to do that, I think it's more of an issue. And they're getting much more return once they use a fertilizer, so it's a double purchase. Right. And, and then there's situations where those sorghum varieties didn't do well at all. The hybrids didn't do well at all. And another colleague has a paper in uh, that was based in Tuchella, and he didn't find any difference with the hybrid. The other, this study and another study that um, is out is published has some differences. So I think, and I would 
argue that it really did depend on the farmer's family function and acquired variable fertility and the resources of that animal. So the seed that's that's sold from the, the co-op, is it um, does it tend to be more free of weed seed? And is it more I mean free of well, weed, weed seeds and like seeds as well? Mm -hmm. Like so you have a better chance of getting the higher quality piece of plant from the ground. So I just I didn't get to present that today, so I just did that. <laughs> I I looked at that this summer. I collected seed from farmers and from the cooperative and from vendors. And then actually the lab that analyzed it for me gave me all of their data and that they collected over the um, year. And there are not differences in terms of weed seed and germination and vigor between any of those sources. It's very high germination quality, uh, it's very high seed quality. Um, and there are, there are, yeah. My hypothesis was actually that commercial growers, it actually might be lower, but I don't have that evidence yet. Anyone? Has there been any work done to evaluate the nutritional value for the different varieties? Especially in terms of micronutrients like iron or zinc? There has been. There was a midnight funded project that they worked on uh, where they considered iron and zinc. And I still think they saw a lot of differences between the varieties. Uh, I, I don't remember the results. There has been studies, but I don't want to say for sure. Because I mean, you, you mentioned that there's some varieties have more. Like higher amount or higher percentage of bran versus the right. others, and then probably the bran retains more micronutrients. Exactly. Probably. Right. And they so part of that nutrition study, they looked at whole grain processing as well to try and see if the including the bran would increase the iron, and it did. But whether they didn't do the bioavailability study on that, whether or not people were being they were getting that. Yeah, I can. Share that with you as the actual results. <laughs> well, I found out on your question on the sort of chain training for plant breeders. Um, I think you just have to look at you know, who's who's paying the who's paying the plant breeder in the market side. So all that is twelve percent of the global market. Oh. You're going to attack the eighty, the eighty-eight percent if you're going to if you're being paid by all these people mm -hmm. working in the in the private sector, and, and twelve percent, and then and Mali is probably a lot larger than uh, twelve percent. But like you said, somebody has to be somebody has to be funding that. And then on the you know releasing a lot of different varieties, and then letting people select, you know, sort of makes sense. Once again, I think if I was in a in a private company, you also not only do you look have success, but you can't, you know, you have a cost of, of failure because you have to, you know, contract and produce and market all those varieties which have a cost. And so if I you know, was releasing 20 and 17 of them fail, there's gonna be a lot of cost to, to that failure. So what if you're releasing them four years earlier. <laughs> but yeah, so no, I'm I saying if, it, if you're that. if you're a company, mm -hmm. it's going to be, and if that's you know, most of these plant breeding positions are private companies, it's going to be totally, going to be totally different. And then I don't think the the training is going to change that much because they still have to make the money to pay the plant breeders to, mm -hmm. to keep yeah. doing what they're doing. Right. So, right. But if the, if you have a big Big uh, um, NGO or government funded program where there is no profit. Um, that's still not really that's still not really going to be true. They're not going to put resources into programs <laughs> that don't return something. So how do we see those people? <laughs> I think the, the, the international centers have to have to be the ones that are the ones that are doing. It. Yeah. 
play with me. Yeah. I just wonder, like, yeah, it's only it's a twelve percent, but if if big companies are the ones that are doing all of the premium, then it's it's yeah, it's yeah, it's it's us, it's the majority of farmers though that are don't have access to improved What advice do you give to aspiring plant breeders on that topic? What factors do they need to watch out for if they want to take their work internationally and feed the world? I would say be open to interdisciplinary teams. I, I don't expect plant breeders to figure out all of these nuances. And, you know, if you think of even in a public situation at a private company, there's normally market people or somebody that um, figuring out what is needed um, by the growers or by the consumers or whatever it is. So I I think having that kind of open mind and perspective on how these different sciences come together to give us information about improving the livelihood, whether it's through agronomy and genetics or a social scientist um, looking at markets or talking to farmers and stuff. And that's one of the things that the CG system is trying to do is kind of create this gender and, and plant breeding um, consortium, or they've done it over the last few years, thinking about what those plant breeders need to have to be able to breed for those environments. And a lot of it is having that openness because a plant breeder got a lot to do <laughs> and to be able to, and, and some of the ideas are to have teams that figure out those pieces and, and they're part of that team rather than a plant breeder having to understand gender nuances and this and that. Any additional questions for Dr. Isaac? 